Hello there, everyone. I am Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach. I'm the founder of the Dream Business Mastermind, author of these six awesome books that can help you grow your dream business. I'm the creator of No Hassle Newsletters, which is an extraordinary done-for-you newsletter program used by over 1,200 small business owners in nine countries. But most importantly today, I am the host of Dream Business Radio, now in its 10th year. This is episode 537, so another fantastic live edition of Dream Business Radio with my special guest, Michael Davis. Michael, how are you doing today from Cincinnati? I'm doing very well, Jim. Thank you for having me on and uh, love those accomplishments you've got. <laughs> well, it's not my first, you know, I'm not 21 anymore as the color on my face indicates. Um, anyway, hey folks, this episode of Dream Business Radio is brought to you by the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program. If you're an entrepreneur, small business owner who's tired of slow to no growth in your business, I am talking fast because this is going to be a great show. <laughs> or if you're feeling overwhelmed, unfocused, but especially if you're interested in creating multiple streams of revenue in your business, then check out the Dream Business Mastermind and Coaching Program led by me, Captain Jim Palmer. That is at dreambizcoaching.com, dreambizcoaching.com. Okay, real quick before I uh, jump in and introduce Mike, I want to say a quick thank you to uh, literally a couple hundred people that reached out with uh, condolences and got some private emails from uh, a lot of people on my uh, team about the passing of my father-in-law. It's uh, been a difficult week, but um, we're, we're back at work today. I'm very happy to to do that. So thank you. All right. Let me tell you a little bit about Michael and we'll dive right into this very important topic. One of my favorites, believe it or not, now it is. Michael Davis helps professionals attract more clients, create efficient teams and increase their influence with improved speaking skills. His passion for his work was born when he was threatened with a job loss because of his poor speaking skills. I almost didn't graduate high school because I had bad speaking skills. With the help of thought leaders and industry experts, he discovered how to become an impactful speaker, trainer, and coach. Michael has helped speakers on five continents, and he has written seven storytelling books. He's a speaker, trainer, and the founder of Speaking CPR. He lives in Ohio with his partner, Linda, and the overlords of their house, Sky and Riley, the super chihuahuas. Oh, boy. Michael, welcome to Dream Business Radio, my friend. Thank you, Jim. It occurred to me, I know why you're speaking so quickly. Why is that? Because you don't want people playing this video at 2x later on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that all sound like Mickey Mouse. I talk fast anyway. I just want to cram as much in. So, Michael, everyone knows the old, um, the familiar line from that old Seinfeld episode. Given the chance, most people would rather be in the casket or coffin than delivering the eulogy. That's the level of fear that most people have about public speaking. Um, so did you hate public speaking or were you just bad at it and you got the threatening your job or what led you into this? Well, I'll first start with a counter to the Seinfeld quote. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he definitely, he did say that. I discovered a few years ago that it's not public speaking that we're afraid of. Okay. What we're really afraid of is public humiliation. Oh, true. And another big fear that we have is walking into a room full of strangers. So what is public speaking? It is the threat of public <laughs> humiliation in front of a huge group of strangers. That's exactly right. Those are the root causes. But from my own situation, it all started on a desk in first grade. I was punished for breaking a class rule one day. And the punishment was that I had to stand on top of my desk during <gasps> nap time. That's not safe. <laughs> well, it wasn't safe physically, but it was even less safe emotionally because right. at some point all of my classmates decided we're going to taunt it. And I mean, I was getting the, oh yeah, you're stupid, all of that. And that went on for 35 minutes. Mm. And when I stepped down, my teacher said, I hope you've learned your lesson. And I had, I thought I'm never standing in front of people again, that was awful. And for the next 25 years, I never voluntarily stood in front of a group until ironically, I become a certified financial planner. And I'm told you're going to have to present workshops to attract yes, the lunches, <laughs> the lunch, the dinners. And it didn't take long for me to start getting feedback that was negative. And one day my boss sat me down in his office and said, uh, went through a bunch of evaluations, none of them positive. And he said, I quote, you're a lousy speaker your stories suck. Mm. Fix this in the next 90 days or else we got to let you go. Wow. What did you do? I looked for 
help, I immediately started calling friends and they suggested a couple of public speaking organizations, which is where I went. I mean, at mm -hmm. this point, I, I'd forgotten the incident from first grade. I mean, it was right. buried in my subconscious. I just knew I was afraid and I wasn't effective. So I discovered along the way, number one, everybody's had a bad experience. Number two, public speaking is a skill that can be developed. It's learnable. Who knew? And it's also human nature to be afraid of standing in front of other folks. Right. So with that knowledge, I started diving into it and I kept going back and eventually learned how to manage nerves. You don't get rid of them. Second, that I do have something valuable to say. And by picking up formats and, and strategies on how to effectively create a memorable message and deliver it authentically, took two decades but eventually I discovered how to become more confident and feel like, yes, I've got something valuable to say. And then I don't know, about 12 years ago, I noticed people were asking me for help. Oh, wow. And that's when I decided yeah, I should get into the coaching aspect of this. So I started this company a very small, it was a weekend project. And so then, while you were still employed, you started kind of like a side gig. Yeah, side exactly. It was okay. a side gig. And I just did it out of, as a hobby, but I had more and more people coming to me. And eventually they started paying. Eventually they started paying some pretty nice amounts. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, this feels like what I'm supposed to be doing. Financial planning is fun. I like it, but I didn't have a passion for it. Right. This, I felt like there are people I, I, I get the fear, the humiliation, the, the regret of missed opportunities because I was afraid to, to share my voice and my ideas. And I thought I can help other people with that. And that's what I want to do. So here I am. Yeah, I could see where being a financial planner, um, because that's not my forte. Luckily, we work with a pretty good company. But being a financial planner can change lives. But it's kind of like one of those things you have to take care of. Being a speaker and speaking eloquently and, and, you know, having an impact like that could really change lives. Is that, is that, was, was that kind of the difference what you're seeing there? Yeah. So when I first started this and, and I was getting hired, Jim, I thought I, I had this idea that I could help a hundred people a year with financial mm. planning. What if I could help a hundred advisors improve their communication skills sure. so they could help a hundred. Now I'm scaling impact. And that's what it's about. Making sure that, that people are getting the, the, the best messages out there and impacting as many people as possible. It's impossible to gauge how many people you can help with what I do today. And I've accepted the fact long ago, and I tell my clients this, you're never going to know how many people you truly touch. Yeah. Um, just curious when, so how long did you do it as a part-time gig? And when did you have to say, okay, I'm going to leave my full-time job and really, you know, make speaking CPR my full-time business Se seven years oh it was my a, goodness originally a three-year plan okay i like to extend things but back <laughs> in 2018 i i built enough momentum and i thought okay i i just turned 55 now you've got a decision to make <laughs> you're not young anymore as you mentioned yourself i'm not 21 i've got yep. to make a choice i can't live in two worlds so i just decided to go for broke and uh don't regret it one bit did you have any um, entrepreneurs? I always ask this parents, grandparents, does anybody kind of show you that there is an alternative to W2 paycheck and paid vacation? Yes. Parents owned a dry cleaner for seven years. Okay. When I was, uh, in my late teens, I worked in it and I saw the benefits and the downside of owning a business, but it was a great education for me at a young age to just watch what they had to do. And being independent people themselves and teaching me to be independent. It's like, I can't work for someone else very well. Yeah. I mean, God willing, I'm still going to do this for a few more years, but I could never work for somebody again. I mean, I did for many years, but I'm like, God, there's just no way. Um, so what do you, what is the greatest skill that you teach at speaking CPR? Is it how to be a speaker, how to overcome nerves, or is it the art of storytelling or is, or is it all the above? That's a really good question. I, I, yeah, it is all the above, but I think the most important skill that, that we teach now is teaching people to trust that they have something valuable to say. Mm. You and I, and if you're watching this live or recorded, you are subject to a concept called the curse of knowledge. 
Now, that has curse of knowledge has a couple of implications. Number one, as speakers, we have to be careful that we don't know our topic so well that we assume our audience does. So we start using jargon terminology. Right. That's one version of curse of knowledge. The other is I know my topic so well, I don't see anything special about my experience and my knowledge. You start undervaluing it because it seems commonplace to you. Yes. You forget that 99.9% .9 of the world, and that's that's research, not really, but it's 99.9% .9 of the world does not know your topic like you do. You have so much value and you don't see it because you live it every day. Mm. And I learned that from, of all people, my mother. My mother was born in German-occupied France oh. during World War II. And one day she was, this is 20 years ago, she was telling me all these experiences my grandparents had with her and her older sister, just little girls, and they were part of the French resistance. Mm -hmm. So at any time, the Gestapo could have knocked on their door and cut to the chase. They would have shot them on sight if they knew right. what they were doing. Yep. And every day was a struggle to find food. And every night you had to worry about, are we going to have bombs dropped on us? This was day after day after day mm. for three and a half years. So when my mom gets done telling me this story, Jim, I'm like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. I did not know this. Mom, how did grandma and grandpa do that? How did you get through that ordeal? She looked at me for the longest time and she said, well, honey, that's just what we did. Yeah. And it didn't occur to me at the time, Jim, but she was telling me, well, a one, pretty, she was telling you a powerful story. Yeah, She was telling me, I don't see any value in this. I just lived it. And that's when mm -hmm. it occurred to me. Every person has that same experience. You had some extraordinary journeys out on the ocean and you, you shared some with me, but I'm sure there are others that you're like, well, we just did it. <laughs> We're out on the water. Sinking was not an option. We had to overcome. <laughs> right. You and your wife have those kind of stories that you tend to discount because, well, we did it. Yeah. So um, there's a lot. Of, I mean, there's a lot of things sort of come in vogue, so to speak. And storytelling is one of those things that seems to be kind of hip right now. Saying hip is probably makes me sound old, but <laughs> storytelling is important. I mean, you know, as a business coach, I'm teaching people not only to respect and uh, appreciate the true value they bring from a, a pricing perspective, but if you do get up and speak before a group, don't get up there and say, hey, how you doing? Thanks for coming. What a beautiful auditorium, blah, blah, blah. You go in with a story, correct? I mean, is that what you teach? Launch right into it because you, you have about 30 seconds at the most to captivate them. Yes, you bring up a good point, and it, I think it's hip to say hip still. <laughs> okay, good. We're close in age, so That's we'll right. just be two unhippers. <laughs> now, here's the thing about storytelling, and it has it has inspired the title of my new book. Actually, my old boss inspired the title of my new book, which is Your Stories Suck. Mm. Here's what I'm seeing is that people are hearing, get out there and tell your story. It is a hot topic. Right. Well, storytelling is not a hot topic topic in the sense that we've been telling it since before we had written language. It's how our ancestors passed on their lessons, their morals, their ethics, their history. So it's it's part of who we are as human beings. Right? People know that. Here's the challenge I'm seeing. People are getting up and they're just sharing narratives that are bullet pointed reports. And they sound like a reporter standing on a street corner reporting for the news. Right. What my big kick right now is, is I have a keynote called stop telling stories, start creating experiences. Okay. Audiences today more than ever want to be entertained. And in that entertainment, we have to bury messages and valuable insights. Mm. So that means you don't report. I did this and I did that. And I, no, we take us into those scenes in storytelling. There are two foundational elements. One is getting emotional, meaning, You've got to inject emotion into it and trigger that emotion in your listeners. And there are six common emotions all human beings share. Happiness, anger, sadness, surprise, disgust, and fear. So if you can insert at least one of them, and don't artificially put it in there just to manipulate people's emotions. Right. It will come out of an interaction within stories. Mm. So get emotional. And the second concept is what we call vaccinate your speech. Okay. Not that vaccination that half the world is fighting over. Now, this is one we can all agree on. 
vaccinate is spelled V-A-K-S, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and smell. Mm. Now, if you're a medical person, I know the correct word for smell is olfactory, but vaconate does not work for my metaphor, so I say <laughs> smell. And I also know there's taste involved. Okay. But when we can create a scene that involves those elements, the sensory elements, all of a sudden, your story starts to become that story of your listeners. They start tapping into their experiences. And all of a sudden, it's a shared experience. And it's not just a story anymore. And when you uh, can bury a lesson in there that they can take away, they're going to remember you. And they're going to remember the message forever. So when you're working with clients... Um... I mean, there's everything from TED Talks, which I think are about 10 minutes generally. There's a half hour, one hour keynote, sometimes, you know, 90 minutes. I think anything longer than that, you got to put a break in there. But um, do you teach people how to how to storytell all the way down into like 10 minutes and all the way up to like, you know, an hour or so, like a keynote? Well, we have two elements. We we have a high impact speaking framework and a high impact storytelling framework. Very different frameworks because stories I, I don't like to put a limit on stories because as a great storytelling coach out there says the, the story is as long as it needs to be and no longer well that's just like copywriting <laughs> right are you for short copy or long copy your copy needs to be as long as it needs to be and no longer yes so for stories i'll say general rule of thumb three to five minutes is about all you need for a good story to tell okay. a, a good lesson a, a keynote uh, you mentioned Ted. I mean, I'm seeing them as short as five to seven minutes now. They go as long as 18, but in there, uh, that's a TED Talk. Keynotes are now they're they're shortening them to 30 minutes in some cases. Mm. 30 to 60 to 90 is that range. We teach a modular concept of speech creation, meaning you can create a 90 minute talk with different supporting points, and if at the last minute they say to you, Jim, sorry, CEO went over time. We've got to cut your 90 down to 30. Can you do it? No problem. <laughs> I'm just going to pull these three or four points out that I was going to make, okay. save those for a future speech, and you can still have impact. So there is a framework, right? Um, yes. If you have a if you have 30 minutes to give a, a, a presentation in front of a group, um, it, maybe this is a question you can't answer, but is there a certain number of stories within a 30-minute presentation? Because you do have to deliver content, right? You do. I mean, if you're a financial guy, you got to talk about 401ks and this, that, and the other thing. Stories are nice, but they help support. Like, what's the framework in an average 30 minute presentation? If, if that's for, a legitimate question. 30 minutes, question. there's a rule we use, and it is a legitimate question. Uh, it's We use a framework, a, a rule called the 10 to 1 rule. For every okay. 10 minutes of speaking time, you should have one supporting point for your main point. For every yeah. 10 minutes, you should have at least one supporting point for the main point. Is the main point the reason that we're there to listen to you? Is that what you mean? Yes. Okay. And actually, I don't want to nitpick, but it's not at least one point. No more than one point for every 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Because that enables you to go deeper. Mm. For example, when I'm talking about storytelling, I mentioned get emotional and vaccinate your story. Well, if I've got a 30-minute talk, I will feel... I will use just those two and go deep into those because we have to remember we have an opening and a conclusion to the speech. Right. A challenge that almost every person we've worked with has is that they tend to overstuff information into their presentations. I call that the lunch buffet effect. Yeah. Uh, you got to try everything. <laughs> exactly. What happens when you try everything an hour later, you're sitting in your seat looking for a cot. That's right? right. I don't even want to go to my car. I just want to nap. <laughs> and if people were asked you later in the day, what'd you have for lunch? I don't remember. It I was stuffing. Know. It was good, but I don't yep. remember. Now, I mentioned that because we do that same, have that same effect on our audiences. We stuff that we have to try everything because I think there are two reasons that we do this as speakers, by the way. Number one, we love our topic so much, we're going to inundate you with everything. But more often than not, it's insecurity. And I think a lot of speakers, um, at least the ones I've seen, so it's it's my own brilliant deduction. You, you may have a different opinion, but they just want to impress so much. They're going to cram all this knowledge in. And it's like dr drinking from a fire hose is, is an expression you hear. 
Uh, that's a terrific observation. That's it. It's, it's a sense of insecurity. I've got to prove to you that I belong up here. And what mm. people are looking for is the exact opposite. They're already inundated with information. They What's, don't need, I was gonna say, they don't need more information. This little device right here will give me more information than you can ever give me in a presentation. That's right. Um, so what's the biggest misconception about storytelling? I mean, beginning, middle, end, or like, because we're talking about storytelling in the framework of a presentation, not just how do you tell a great story, right? So how do you, how do you build that story into a presentation? Because most of the people watching this are small business owners who probably get up and speak to groups about X, Y, and Z. And if they want to interject a story or two in their, in their presentation, what's the framework for that? Well, let me address the first question. It's a two-part question you just okay. asked. Number one, what's the biggest misconception? I haven't climbed Mount Everest. I haven't discovered Titanic at the bottom of the ocean. Who would want to listen to me? Mm. All right. I've never had anybody raise their hand in years of asking this question in a workshop. Raise your hand if you've climbed to the top of Everest, won a gold medal. I did meet the gentleman, who, uh, Dr. Baller, who discovered Titanic, so I can't ask that one. But oh, wow. <laughs> I... I nobody's ever raised their hand. So the point of that is, if most people haven't done it, how can they relate to the speaker who has? Hmm. What we can relate to is those day-to-day -day frustrations, those challenges that everybody in your audience is facing. Talk about those. But that goes back to the curse of knowledge. Well, who cares? I, I had a, a business problem. I had to overcome uh, an employee leaving unexpectedly, which whatever the problem is, we can relate to those. So don't discount those frustrations, those failures, those flaws that you've had, because those are relatable. So um, you said you have a book on how to do great storytelling. Is that correct? I should have known that. Sorry, but I think you That's mentioned. Okay, you have yeah, a <laughs> yeah I, I, my first book was the book on storytelling. OK. And then the second one that's coming out later this year. Um, your story suck, which just my, my boss did me such a favor helping me create the title of a book 30 years ago when he said that. It's funny how that works. Couldn't have known. But let's go back to your question about what type, how do you structure your story? Yeah. If you're a business owner, there are two effective types of stories. One is the origin story. I gave you a shortened version of one to tell you why I do what I do is because yep. I was humiliated in first grade mm -hmm. and I understand the frustration, the fear, and the regret. That's an origin type story. Okay. The second is the successful client story. Mm. Now, this is where you introduce a client. And I get for privacy reasons, just give the client a different name. Nobody's going to fact check you. Right. Talk about a client who was having a problem and they could not solve it on their own. The person met you. You introduced a new concept, a product, a service, or an idea. They implemented it. Maybe after some initial difficulties, they started to have some success until they reached the point in the story where they overcome the original problem. Okay. Now they're living a new and better life. That kind of story will appeal when you're out speaking in a chamber or a rotary group. And when there are people sitting in the audience who can relate to the client in the story, they'll want to talk to you. That's right. They'll come up to you. Yeah. It's, I love to call it the, it's the, when Harry met Sally moment, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your, your people in the audience ha are having these problems and they want to solve them. I'll have what your client had. Um, time is going way too fast. Cause I, I love this topic and I think a lot of people can you, can use some help. So we might go two or three minutes long if that's okay. You don't have, you don't have a hard stop to you or, or no, I'm fine. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, time. I was looking at, uh, at your website, which is pretty, which is, uh, which is pretty cool. Speaking CPR.com, right? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> yep. And one of your blog posts, I'm, I'm just have to ask this. It's titled, when is it okay to use words like um and ah? I was under the impression that's not a good thing. It's okay to use them. Be, I think it's okay in any situation. What you don't want to do is use them all the time, obviously. But ever so often, if you throw in an um or an er, it's not hurting your presentation because that's a conversational gap filler that we all use. Okay. Each of us has done it in this interview. I'm sure I don't remember when it's part of human conversation. Yeah. 
what you want to do is limit their use. Okay. When you've got some, when you're listening to a speaker who every 10, 15 seconds is saying, um, that's annoying. But once in a great while, don't beat yourself up on it. You're not, we're not looking for perfection from a speaker. We're looking for connection. So an occasional um or er, not a big deal. Not a big deal. Um, another blog post, which made me think of my great friend, uh, Melanie Benson, just a terrific mindset coach. I've had her speak at all my events. And uh, after a while, she would she'd maybe go 10, 15 minutes and she goes, so let me just pause for a minute. I want to check in with you. Right. And so one of your blog posts is titled, when should you check in to keep your audience from checking out? Is is that what you mean? What Melanie did or was there something slightly different? Yeah, very similar to what Melanie's doing in a story. Now, I gave you the short version of mm -hmm. my story, what happened in first grade. I'll give you an example of how I do this is I'll say when I was in uh, six years old, I loved to entertain people. I loved to make people laugh. I was a bit of a ham. Mm -hmm. So that's why one day during indoor recess in first grade, I have this thought. I'm so bored. I'm going to get up on my desk and have fun. Imagine you're standing in a room full of first graders. They're stuck inside. What does that look like to you? That's the checking in, right? What does it sound like? Mm. Yes, it's checking in and it's also pulling you right into my story because I want you in that room with us. Yeah. And when you do that, it, it, it's a type of check-in. Another type is, uh, I might be talking about, uh, you know, when I have my meeting in my boss's office. I'm sitting in my boss's office. I'm ready for uh, what I'm expecting to be our weekly Friday review. Have you ever gone into a meeting, expected to go one direction, and it went completely the other? That's an audience check-in. Yeah. I mean, the word imagine, as somebody studied copywriting for a long time, imagine is just a trigger word because it's just, okay, now I'm going to imagine. What should I imagine? Then you tell them, right? Like you exactly. did. Yeah. And that's how you how you draw them in. This is such fascinating. Um, I'm not a big fan of, so I'm going to break my own rule. Hey, what's the one thing? But what would be one thing, only because we're limited on time, that somebody sure. who's listening, what could they do to, to boost their storytelling in order to keep the listener interested. Because if you, if they're not interested, your story could be great or it could suck, whatever. But you have to keep them interested to, to teach. So what what one thing they could do to boost your story and keep keep the listener interested? To help create more of an experience. You can do these check-ins we talked about, but what dialogue is critical. When you've got conversation in, between characters, don't say, well, I was on a podcast with Jim and he asked me a bunch of these questions and one in particular really piqued my interest and I was happy to answer. No, I could say I was on a podcast with Jim and he asked me and then, hey, what's the most important part of storytelling? And I gave him this answer. See, you want the dialogue between characters, but what's even more powerful is internal dialogue. Hmm. I, I, when I tell the desk story. Yeah. I could say, well, I was humiliated and I felt terrible, or I could take you into my mind when I was standing on that desk, my friends are looking at me and all I can think is, I just want to get down. I'm just, I just want to get down. I won't be bad again. Let me get down. Right now you're in my head and you can relate to being six years old, wanting to get away from a situation. People start to feel the story more than just hear about it. They're active participants. So, I mean, this is, I mean, dare I call it a masterclass because it's just a half hour interview, but man, there's some seriously good tips here. Um, let me get, well, let me squeeze one more question in because yeah. while, while I have you. So there's storytelling and storytelling can be part of an overall presentation, but let's talk about the presentation itself, like a half hour presentation. I think I know the answer, but I'm, I'm open to learn. <laughs> What's the most important part of that 30 minute presentation? Having a foundational concept, a less a, a sentence that's less than 10 words that people will uh, remember long after they hear you speak. So I'm working on a keynote. Uh, the keynote is stop telling stories, start creating experiences. Mm. Hopefully six months after people uh, hear that, they'll be talking to a friend. Hey, remember that guy we heard? He talked about experiences, right? That's what I want them to remember. Don't tell a story, create an experience. So having a short foundational concept, 
that not only is memorable to the main message, but it also serves as a filter for what should go into your speech. If it, if your sub point doesn't support the main idea, it can't go in, no matter how good it is. Yeah. The opening story needs to set up that point, and the conclusion needs to tie back to the point. So, yeah, so what you said, which is not what I, th I thought you would say, is memorable. Because, you know, what's interesting is, um, you know, just being a, a marketer, I'm always fascinated – um, in years past, actually, of uh, commercials, Super Bowl commercials, how much people spend. And did you what commercial did you like? Well, this one there. And what was it about? I don't know. Right. So why would you spend a million dollars or a second or whatever it is? And it's, it's like, I don't know what those goats were doing on this on the side of a roller coaster. But and you have no idea what company it was. Right. So yeah. therefore, it was it was only memorable. I guess you could say it was memorable, but not for the right reason. Right. Correct. And I see this with speakers a lot. <laughs> the best speakers do not worry about whether the audience remembers them. They rem they're, they're concerned, will the speaker remember the message and actually yeah. use it? Not By what you said, but how did you make them feel, right? Exactly. And if it's all about, oh, I want people to remember me and I love to, I just love to get up and speak. And I, that does not make you a good presenter. Right. It doesn't because that's not why people are there. You are just a conduit to a message. And one of the most important lessons I had to learn, Jim, and I've taught my clients is you've got to have an ego to think you have something important to say in front of an audience. However, that ego needs to be tempered by the reality, the harsh reality that if you weren't up there speaking, they'd find somebody else. That's right. <laughs> And so you're not that unique. <laughs> you know, it's about what you provide the audience, and that shouldn't be you. It should be that message. Fascinating half hour, which I can always tell because time goes by so quickly. Because that means I'm engaged. So, um, Michael, thank you so much. It's really great information. Thank you, I, I gave your website, but if there's something else, so you have one book now, and when's the next one? Your present, your presentation sucks, we're, or what was it? We're, we're, uh, your story sucks. Your story sucks. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably be out in the spring, late spring. And uh, there's a resource we have. Uh, you're okay. Welcome to sign up for. It's called Fifty Two Storytelling Insights. It's Five Two Story Insights dot com. That's a weekly five minute audio that comes right to your email inbox. It's an audio lesson. And the idea behind it is to build one skill on top of another over 52 weeks. When I did this, I tripled my productivity when I was doing workshops and seminars to attract new clients. Wow. And and that the URL for that? 52storyinsights.com. Wow. Very cool. Michael, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate your time today. I appreciate it, Jim, and I hope your audience was uh, served well today. I'm sure they're going to love it. Hey, folks, that wraps up this very special interview with my guest, Michael Davis, from Speaking CPR. I should have asked him what CPR stands for. All right, Michael, let me re rewind before I close out here. What does CPR stand for? It's uh, it, it's the CPR that we use to start restart people's hearts. We love to say that we are um, injecting or... Uh, providing new life to stories and, oh. and speeches that are on life support. That right there. See, that's what they're going to remember right there. I'm glad I asked that. All right. Hey, folks, take two. That wraps up this very special interview with my guest, Michael Davis. I highly recommend you connect with him, follow him, and learn from him, and go to 52 Storytelling Insights. Give it one more time. Sorry. 52storyinsights.com. 52storyinsights.com. It, it, I'm a little lack of sleep. People will forgive me for this one. Anyway, right. hey, folks, you can connect with me at GetJimPalmer.com. If you're interested in joining me and about 27 other smart entrepreneurs right now in the Dream Business Mastermind, go to DreamBizCoaching.com. Remember, as part of my legacy building program, I've made all six of my books free in the digital format. So they're free Kindle version at Amazon, Nook Books at Barnes & Noble. And you can also get them in the iBook store, totally free. But that's it. Until this time next week, another fantastic interview. I am Captain Jim Palmer, the Dream Business Coach, and you take good care.